what is up youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel now welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed at least i don't think so y'all today's video is insane it's very much i don't want to spoil it but it's kind of giving fred and mary west low-key y'all i tried to dye two more of my wigs that i bought blonde when I say they turned out horrible, one of them turned out horrible. I can see it from here. The other one, it was supposed to be plum, but child, this is what we get. This is what happened. Nowhere is this plum. This ketchup red. Like, what are you doing? And so with all that being the case, this is the party cap for this video. Anyway, like I said, today's video is super long. This is a long story. And this is going to be a long video. I already know it. So let me just shut my mouth and get right into it. Y'all know I've been heavy into my own brows. I've been feeling my own brows lately, so we're just going to do a little something. Just a little light something. Raymond Fernandez was born to Spanish immigrants on December 17th, 1914. And he was born in Hawaii. Sis was a Sagittarius also, so there's that. Y'all know a Sagittarius is give no shade. When Raymond is just three years old, his parents decide that they are going to move to Connecticut. His father felt like there would be more opportunities there. Maybe he could find better work and just provide a better quality of life to his family overall. And so they pack up their things and head out. Now, unfortunately for his dad, when he gets there, he finds it extremely difficult to find a job. He claims to have faced a lot of discrimination about him being Spanish and also having really broken English. However, he needs a way to support his family financially. And so he just decides to take a series of low paying jobs in an effort to do so. Like he literally will do anything. His father's financial struggles, the way he was being treated on a daily basis, and just overall disappointment at how his life turned out brought him a lot of frustration, which subsequently caused him to drink. And he was drinking a lot, okay, all the time. And unfortunately for little Raymond, his dad was an extremely mean drunk. Raymond was always a very small child. He was very frail, very thin. Some reports described him as sickly, but I couldn't find anything that specifically stated a medical condition that he had that would cause him, you know, to be this way. But nevertheless, he was very thin, very small, and he was not masculine at all. He lacked the toughness and the masculinity that his father believed that all males should have. You know, the toxic masculine type. His father was one of those. He would chastise Raymond about this on the regular, like all the time. But it became a lot worse when he would drink heavily. And he also believed in corporal punishment. But coupled with his disdain for his son and his just overall lack of knowledge of how to be a good parent, this causes his punishments to go from being normal punishment to excessive just outright beatings. You see, Raymond's father really pisses me off because this is the thing. You claim that you have been discriminated against, child, and people treat you so bad, and then you come home and you treat your son worse. Like, make it make sense. It doesn't. Burn him at the stake. Much like many mistreated children, Raymond feared his father a lot. He was very, very afraid of him, but overall his feelings were pretty contradicting. Because on one hand, he feared his father and he just hated to see him coming. But on the other hand, he admired him and looked up to him as this ruler of the palace. He really admired his strength. Raymond desperately desired and strived to be strong and masculine enough to make his father look at him with pride and joy as opposed to shame and discontent. No matter how hard he tried, though, nothing was enough. Like, he could never do anything that would make his father express any kind of pride in him. But he never gave up trying, child. He was always trying. Now, this, of course, manifests itself into a lot of self-esteem issues. He was very self-conscious about his appearance, the way that he expressed himself, his demeanor. And by the time he reached middle school, he was noticing the difference in like his quality of clothes and shoes as opposed to the other kids. So that just added another layer of insecurity. Honey, it also adds a little nasty habit of stealing because he decided you know what if my parents can't afford to have me looking as fly as the other boys and girls then i'll make a way when he is just 15 years old he is jailed for stealing apparently he wasn't that good at it now while he was locked up he reflected on his little life and he decided you know what 
America just ain't it. Like, I don't like what's going on over here and I can't make this work. So as soon as I'm released, I will pack up my little things and go back to Spain. Being as though that's where his family is from, he felt like he probably would do better if he went back to the land of his people and started over, which is what he does. When he is released, he wasted no time over here on American soil child. His relatives there are more than willing to take him in, give him shelter and all of the things, you know, help, help him out. Now he grows into adulthood there over in Spain and things are going pretty well for him he's not having any issues he's not getting into any trouble he's just living life as a young adult right that is until the great depression hits america and his dad who is still over here is like you know what i've had enough of the land of the free and the home of the brave like maybe i should take my behind back to spain as well he's also had time to reflect on his relationship with his son and realize that the way he treated him was just not okay at this point they don't even have contact with each other raymond left and left his little old life behind his father is feeling like you know maybe because we're both still here we can make it right so he writes raymond a letter telling him that he is sorry for all of the things that he wants to rekindle their relationship and that he would love to join him over in Spain. Like maybe, you know, maybe life could be good for me too. Raymond extends the grace that was never shown to him as a child. And he tells him, yeah, like I'm open to it. Let me know when you get here, I guess. Now, by this time, Raymond was doing pretty well for himself. He was able to take care of himself and live comfortably. He was well liked amongst the family, he had friends and child. The ladies liked him too. Now, he had grown up to be still very much lanky and thin, which is not a bad thing. It's just something that his dad shamed him for. The ladies liked him. He was semi-tall. He had this thick, luscious black hair. The girls were here for it. They were here for it and they wanted a piece. Especially this one lady in particular by the name of Incarnation Robles. He meets her, the two fall madly in love and he actually marries her at just 20. Right away, the two of them begin having children and they have a total of four. The thing is, Raymond wasn't ready for all this responsibility, child. He was having all of these kids. He is forced to not only provide for himself, but also provide for his wife and all these children they were having. It put a lot of strain on their marriage and the two began arguing all of the time. It was completely toxic. And just as he had fled the U.S. when things were not working, Shai decided to flee this marriage and these children. Raymond goes and enlists in Spain's military for a short time, but much like his father, he could only secure like really menial, low-paying jobs. Child, they were the only ones calling him back. He works as a gardener. He works as a garbage collector for a little while. Tammy, thank you, girl, again for this Dark Stars cake liner palette. Look at this. And that is Tammy Clark here on YouTube. Makeup by Tammy is her brand, her own makeup brand. If you like cake liners, you should check her out. If you like makeup, period, check her out. She has a cool brand. Raymond, he worked a couple of odd little jobs. These jobs were okay, but they were not jobs that he wanted. He got sick and tired of having a boss, having somebody always telling him what to do. And so he decides that he's just going to travel abroad, goes all the way to Gibraltar, okay? I believe I said that right. If I didn't, we won't act like I did. With the idea of setting up a little ice cream stand, selling little frozen delectables to British military personnel and tourists. He was doing really well for himself. People loved him, business was booming. All of a sudden, this guy one day approaches him and asks to have a personal conversation out to the side. So which he's like, okay, you know, I'll just go see what he's talking about. The guy tells Raymond that he has noticed his bright personality and how easy it was for him to make friends and establish relationships with people that will make them want to keep coming back for his products. This man was from British intelligence and he felt like all of these qualities could be getting put to greater use. Now he tells Raymond that if he could keep it on the down low and be discreet that he could benefit greatly from a position with them as a low level spy. Now as for this portion of his life that's pretty much all I could find about him being a spy. He was in fact very discreet about his dealings with them. The only thing that he did say about his work as as a low-level spy was that he just carried out his tasks which were sometimes difficult and dangerous extremely well. After the war was over and they no longer needed him, that was pretty much it for his little spy work. But he did not want to return to a regular job with a regular boss. It was over for the life that he had known before. And he had no desire to work for anyone else ever again in life. He was hell-bent on that. 
okay the only problem is he didn't quite know where to go to find what he was looking for he wanted something that was adventurous he wanted freedom he wanted it to be fun this leads him to sign on a ship as part of one of the crewmen and sis was ready to get his pirate on okay but unfortunately he suffers a terrible accident that would change his life forever a steel hatch hits him in the head fracturing his skull and damaging his frontal lobe now he gets medical treatment he spends weeks in a hospital and he is fully recovered or so they think child but this accident had many lasting effects on Raymond. He suffered these terrible, horrible migraines all of the time. And not only that, what was most noticeable was his change in personality. See, it also took off some of his little hair, leaving scars in place of it. Now, hair may not seem like much to many people out there. But having spent most of his childhood being made insecure about the way that he looks and his lack of overall appeal then growing up and suddenly becoming very secure in himself very secure in his look which his thick black hair played a significant role in his whip appeal only to have some of it knocked clean off it really does a number on him after the accident he is left partially bald and fully scarred okay sometimes he would wear a hat to just try to cover it up a bit but he still wasn't feeling like his normal sexy self before the accident he was very calm very jovial happy all the time but afterward he was like the complete opposite very gloomy very pessimistic really moody he also became very quick tempered and the slightest smallest little infraction would cause him to blow up but still he is able to remain a member of the cruise ship and he continues out working with them but then they take a trip to the u.s and i don't know what it is about u.s soil that makes him just like to steal but that's what happened. He got caught stealing again and it lands him back in U.S. jail. Now there he is paired with a cellmate who introduces him to voodoo and black magic. The cellmate is pretty much telling him how it works and how he could achieve the things that he wants out of life through the practice, right? His desires from this practice were simple. Irresistible power and charm over women like period that's it this don't want the riches he don't want the cars the house the clothes he just want the hoes raymond spends a year in prison and this time after his release he decides to look up his sister his long lost sister he hadn't talked to her in a minute and he figured that she might be able to help him get on his feet which she accepts him with open arms she misses her brother she is stoked about rekindling their relationship and so she just completely welcomes him into her home unfortunately her idea of what it would be like to rekindle her relationship with her brother is not quite the experience that she imagined it would be he becomes completely dependent on her financially raymond is struggling to find a job that he wants to do and on top of that he is always in a nasty cranky little mood and administering her a good old verbal lash in any time he sees fit to do so, like this ain't her house where she pays the bills. Meanwhile, his interest and practice of voodoo and black magic is never left him. And he has spent just about that entire year practicing with that cellmate. He continued to practice in his sister's home and it made her a little bit uncomfortable, but not so much. She was like, you know what? I'm just gonna let him do him. What bothered her more than anything was him burning those incense. He would burn incense for hours at a time. I hate incense, so I... I felt her on this. He would sit before his altar chanting these indecipherable things. Now see, by this time, it was his belief that he had gotten many of the things that he had been asking for in his practice, right? He had acquired the ability to hypnotize people from afar. And he could also make women do whatever he wanted them to do through thought concentration alone. So should have asked for some riches, okay? But maybe you can't ask for that. I don't know how it works. He would often tell his sister about his practices and the different powers that he possessed. And she was got at him. She really didn't think much of it at all. She was not a believer. And he was not offended by this at all. Instead, he kind of took this as an opportunity to show her better than he can tell her. And she is like, well, okay, show me. And so during this time, the Lonely Hearts Clubs, which you've probably heard about them, but if you have not, it was very popular. It's like a throwback tender. Just imagine Tinder without the app, but like through newspapers and ads and things like that. It's where you would go when you were looking for a lover and or a friend. Raymond begins writing 
several members of the LHC. He is writing letters all over the place. The year is 1947 and one of the women that he writes is a lady by the name of Jane Thompson. Now Jane was recently divorced and she joined the Lonely Hearts Club because she was kind of in fear that she would never marry again. She didn't want to spend the rest of her life alone and so she decided why not give this a chance. Now when she begins receiving letters from Raymond she is impressed with his words. He is romantic, he is charming, he's charismatic and I think he's a little odd job because he asked for a lock of her hair but she didn't seem to think that this was weird. I don't know maybe this was a thing in 1947. Y'all came through and let me know about the plumbing. I genuinely want to know was that a thing like sending a man a lock of your hair or was this his thing? I'm unsure. Nevertheless, even if she did think it was odd, I guess she figured, you know, we all have a glitch, child. I have to have realistic expectations and he checks off all the other boxes because she gave him the green light. The two begin writing each other regularly, corresponding all the time. Now, I ain't gonna lie, when I first saw this, I was like, is he trying to take her little piece of hair and make him like a little patch to cover up the space? Whatever the case, unbeknownst to her, the hair is for a spell that he believed would bring her to her knees and completely under his power. Not long after receiving her hair in the mail, they make plans to meet up in person. By now, he got him a little hat. He was wearing a little hat to cover up the ball space. Later on, he moved to a whole toupee. It was thick and black and curly like the hair he lost. So he put on his little party cap and he goes down to meet with Jane, who is completely enamored by him when they first meet. So of course, he is believing that this is proof to himself and his sister that he has the way with the ladies brought on by his magic but in reality it was probably more so the confidence he exuded through his little hairpiece and the confidence that he already had that reeled her in but in his mind it was the spell you couldn't tell him no different now his little meeting with Jane and the time that they spent right after it really gave him the confidence boost that yes the magic is working so from then on he began to try to charm women that he was passing on his day to day he would gaze at them all extra he would practice his flirting skills with women he put forward a conscious effort to enchant the women and entice the ladies that he just passed on a regular day to day just for the sake of doing so now unfortunately he didn't put a quarter of this effort into finding himself a job and earning some money so he was very much still broke however Jane had a nice little bit of money on her own she also had her own place and so the two of them decide that you know what let's just take a trip to Spain it'll be a nice little getaway he wanted to introduce her to his family and so on her dime they take a trip to Spain sis took him to Spain child I couldn't even take him serious not with that little hair piece and no money once the two of them make it to Spain, they check in their little lodge or hotel as a married couple. And after they do so, Raymond reportedly takes Jane to meet his real wife, but he introduces the real wife, like the one he left behind with all them kids. He introduces her as an old friend. And the three of them go out together. They go to a theater and have dinner. Later on back at the hotel, Raymond and Jane, they have this huge loud Fight. Other people at the lodge, they could hear the commotion, but nobody really got involved. They just felt like it was a lover's quarrel. And I don't know if it was because Jane found out that Miss Mamas was really his wife or what, but something caused them to have this huge blow up. The morning after this argument, Jane is found dead in their hotel room and he is nowhere to be found. Immediately, the authorities are of course called and they suspect that Raymond is the person that is responsible, but they can't find him anywhere. All they know of him is that he is her husband, but he ain't really her husband. So they don't even know that. They don't know anything about who this man is. By the time they had even discovered Jane, he had already taken all of her possessions, all of her money off of her and was headed back to the US. Once he makes it back to the US, he goes to Jane's house, tells her mother that her daughter had been involved in a train wreck and presents to her a fake will that he had written up but he presented it as if it was Jane's will that she had written up and signed and the signature looked so dead on that her mother didn't even question it. Now what was really messed up is the fact that her mother lived in that house with her and the house was included on this fake will so she would have to vacate immediately. Now he does tell her that although the house is left to him she does not have to vacate immediately 
because he's not that horrible of a guy. He said that he was not going to make her leave, that he respected her too much to do so. After all, she was the mother of the love of his life. And he instead suggests that the two of them share the home. He said that he would take care of her just as her daughter did. She wouldn't have to want for anything. He also agrees to take care of her just like her daughter did. And here and then she was happy about it. She was very grateful to him, feeling like he was doing her a favor. Believing everything that he said to be true. He feels like he has proven to his sister through all of this that his spell worked. And that he in fact had these powers. Whether or not he truly believed this himself is unclear. And sis was probably just happy to have him out of her house at that point. So she probably just did not care whether it was true or not. Now, how things unfolded with Jane leads him to a life as a full-blown scammer. At this point, he is completely committed to the role. He reverts back to the pool of presumably lonely women looking for love and casts out his little net in hopes of catching his next victim. From here, he develops this pattern of writing women, seducing them, earning a little bit of their trust, and then stealing from them whatever he could, be it jewelry, money, whatever they had of value. Meanwhile, he is still living in Jane's house with her elderly mother, and he is actually taking care of the woman. When these women realized that they had been scammed or that he had stolen from them, they were really reluctant to go to the police because they were already ashamed of the fact that they were women of particular ages and were not married. Answering ads on the Lonely Hearts Club, it was already something that they felt was shameful enough. Now you add to the fact that somebody didn't swindled you, girl, took all of your coins and things that's like double negative they felt like you know what it's best for us to just take our l's in silence this enabled him to keep going and so he did woman after woman his charm and fake interest earned him enough admiration and trust to take whatever it was that he saw of value and then be off to the next until he meets a woman who much like that hatch on that little ship would change his life forever. Martha Beck was a pretty dark haired, charismatic, thick little something sitting at a little over 300 pounds. Now, as had all the women he'd encountered before her, she had entered the Lonely Hearts Club in hopes of finding her soulmate and filling the void that this lack of romance had caused in her life. And she was elated to have received a letter from Mr. Smooth Operator Raymond Fernandez. Now, Martha was born Martha Seabrook. She was born in Milton, Florida on May 6th of 1920. And she had a pretty traumatizing start to life. She was born to a very strong, dominant mother and a very submissive passive father who abandoned the family completely when she was just 10 years old now she reportedly has a glandular issue like medically that will cause her to gain excessive weight this issue reportedly caused Martha to be overweight pretty much her whole life and as a result of being teased for it she was a very reserved very shy child Martha began developing early and this caused her to get a lot of unwanted male attention unfortunately it also attracted the attention of her own brother who assaulted her at age 13. To add insult to injury, she goes and tells their mother that it had happened. And when she does, the mother blames her, saying that she must have seduced him, beat her for it, and tell her she is never to speak of this again. From there, she pretty much throws herself into books. She's reading fiction. She's also very into her schoolwork. She enrolls into nursing school and graduates first of her class. So sis was out here doing it on the education front. And at this point, she is extremely excited about her future, which looks very promising. And she is hopeful that she is off to the start of a great life, despite how roughly it had begun. Now, after graduating, despite how well she did academically, she had a very difficult time securing a job. It appeared to her that the thinner, prettier nurses were the girls that were getting all of the jobs. And she began to feel like for sure she was being discriminated against because of her size. This could not secure a job amongst the living and so she accepts a job offered to her by an undertaker. Her job was pretty much to just prepare the bodies for him and she didn't want to be doing this on the back end. She wanted to be helping people on the front end so she did not like this job at all. Furthermore, she felt like she had put forward so much effort to get herself a better life and look at where she landed. Like this was not how things were supposed to turn out for her. Still, she does the job for nearly a year and then she catches wind that there is a nurse shortage over in California. So at that point, she decides that she is going to pack up all of her little worldly possessions and take a chance 
at living a good life over in California. Now for her, this was actually a good step because it takes her no time to secure a job as a nurse amongst the living. But still, there was a void a desire that she was so desperate to fulfill romance child she wanted herself a man she would spend all of her spare time diving into different romance novels and movies vicariously living through the women in the stories fantasizing about the day that she too would be knocked off of her feet you know that kind of thing unfortunately from her Okay, unfortunately for her, not having any friends or family really contributed to her loneliness and her sadness. Now, since one wasn't lonely for long, though, she began having this little rendezvous with the bus driver. And things were going well in her point of view. Granted, he wasn't trying to give her much commitment, but she felt like things were going okay at least. Until she finds out that she is pregnant and she begins pressuring him to go ahead and marry her so she's not a single mother out here. And he does not want to marry sis at all. Martha really felt like and believed that she could change his mind. He maybe just needed a little bit of a push. She continued to put the pressure on him until finally he was like, you know what? I'd rather die than to marry you. And he literally makes an attempt on his own life. Fortunately, it is unsuccessful and he lives. But Martha is like, well, damn, she couldn't believe that. Like, you willing to go that far not to be with me? At that point, instead of staying there and continuing to push him, Martha relocates to Pensacola, Florida and decides she's going to go somewhere where nobody knows her team and start over not only that though she was gonna make her own tea up she slides on a wedding band and tells people when she gets there that her husband is away in the war she definitely wanted to spare herself the shame of being an unwed pregnant woman now after everybody else's husband had come home from the war and hers had not she tells them that he had tragically lost his life fighting for this country and they believed it that was actually pretty clever honestly i gotta give her that that was pretty clever so she never felt the shame of being an unwed pregnant woman. Instead, she got sympathy from these people. Now, apparently, sis had a thing for bus drivers. Not long after she gave birth to her child, she becomes pregnant again by another bus driver. Not that there's anything wrong with bus drivers. Just, you know, it's kind of a coincidence. Like, sis, is this your type? Do you just get on the buses and flirt with the men's girl? I just don't understand. Now, she has better luck with Alfred Beck, who she is now pregnant by. He actually decides to marry her once he finds out that she is pregnant. But unfortunately, it doesn't last long because literally six months later, they divorce and then she gives birth to a son. Single again, back on the prowl. And now with the second child, she decides that she is going to shift her focus from the love back to her career because she now has two little people to feed. She secures a job down to the Pensacola Crippled Children's Home. I feel like it's problematic that they call it that. She works the job. She loves it. Everything is going fine. But then again, there is this one nagging void that just creeps up miss mamas again that needing and longing for a romantic partner she tried to ignore for a while but she got tired of being around them kids all the time and eventually she decides you know what i'm going to go out and try to find love and this is when she joins the lonely hearts club she is of course smitten when she receives a letter from raymond fernandez because up to this point everybody else was swiping left on my girl the two exchange several letters and then they finally decide to meet up Raymond travels all the way from New York City to Florida to meet up with her and he immediately is smitten by her, enamored by her beauty. And from the moment she laid her beady little eyes on that thin black wig wearing Casanova, her little belly was instantly filled with butterflies. Not to mention, sis had a thing for Charles Boyer. He was like her celebrity crush and to her, they looked exactly alike. And I'll put a picture because I feel like there is a strong resemblance. So sis was all in. Now my notes say that they resembled each other around the forehead and the receding hairline, but I'm not gonna be shady like that and say that they do. Now we know what Raymond gives and what he's here for, but surprisingly, and unlike all of the other women, he is genuinely smitten by Martha. Child, he ain't never had it like that. Baby Martha was gonna keep him warm at night and fed and he was here for it. They had a genuine instant connection. And during the days that he spent there in town with her, they were completely inseparable. They spent all of the days doing the nasty in the hotel room. Where was your kids at, girl? That's what I want to know. Where was Martha's children? Now, although he genuinely liked Martha, he was still somewhat disappointed to find that sis did not have 
that much money any land she didn't own anything that was like super valuable any jewels or anything like that this made him really eager to return home because he needed to hit his next lick like he was running out of money so he needed to be somewhere with the honey that had some money. He decides that he needs to cut the trip short. So he tells Martha, you know, I had a great time with you. This was nice. You'll be hearing from me. I'll be writing you, right? And Martha is feeling really good about his visit. So she is completely taken aback when she receives a letter from him stating that he wanted to call it off. Like he wanted to just say goodbye and that what they had was fun. Now she is completely devastated because in her mind, she has met the man of her dream. She has met her knight in shining armor. She is also very confused because she felt like they were on good terms and things were going well and so for her broken little Martha decides her next move she was gonna pull one of her ex's stunts her first baby's father's stunt she threatens to end it all if he truly honestly did not want to be with her like life was no longer worth living now, being as though he genuinely did like Martha, he decides to continue their correspondence back and forth, continue writing her and getting to know her, right? And so she's like, okay. Meanwhile, you know how people down at your job getting your business and even when they don't know your business, what they think they know, they like to talk about and spread around as if they know it to be true. Well, word it got back to one of her coworkers that she had spent the weekend parlaying in this hotel room with this man and she was not married to him. Now, I told you this is back in the days where that was frowned upon more than frowned upon actually she is called into the office and questioned about this by her boss she does not lie about it she comes clean and tells them the truth but she tries to smooth it over by saying that they were in fact definitely gonna get married like he ain't my husband right now but he's gonna be my husband real soon so don't you worry unfortunately this is not good enough for her employer and they fire her because of this ain't that crazy girl where is hr now, Martha is a single mother of two who has just lost her job, but she sees this as a good thing, not a bad thing, because now what's holding her back in Florida? Like, what is there that is keeping her from joining her man in New York? She felt like this was a blessing in disguise. She doesn't even tell Raymond about it or any of the things. She doesn't ask him or anything. She packs up all of her things and her children and literally just looks at the address from his letter and shows up at the doorstep. Now he is surprised by them showing up, but he does not turn them away. He allows them to come in, but he's again feeling like maybe Martha is not the woman for him, despite how he feels about her. Like she got these two kids and this is all too much. He don't even want his kids, girl. His kids back in Spain somewhere. Raymond loved and admired Martha mainly because she was very smart. She was very strong willed and demanding. Unlike the women that he had been scamming all of these years and finessing, she was different and she loved him too. She was no longer settling for the vicariously living through the characters in the novels that she had read. She was living her very own love story and things were as close to perfect as she could have expected them to be. Except there were these two itty bitty things standing in the way of their true happiness bliss and they're happily ever after martha's kids raymond tells martha that he doesn't feel like there is space enough for him martha her two kids and of course jane's elderly mother is still living there in the house so if she wanted to remain with him the kids had to go and baby them kids were out of here do you hear me there were multiple sources that said that she dropped them off at the salvation army but there was also like two or three stories that said she dropped them off with family but she had no connection to her family so it's like girl did you really take them down to the salvation army because what family do you have that you were in contact with. I think sis might have taken them down to the Salvation Army for sure. But between those two scenarios, she got those kids out of there pronto with no hesitation. And the thing is, Raymond felt like because she did this for him and her willingness to do this for Raymond made him love her even more. He felt like her love for him was truly unconditional. If as a mother, she just go drop her children off down to the Salvation Army. They continued their little life together, but Jane's mother was not particularly fond of Martha. She didn't like Martha at all. She was really uncomfortable being in the house with those two. And so she makes arrangements to vacate and go live with more family of hers which was a great great idea at this point martha still does not know what her man really does for a living or for any of his money she has no income coming in and he is just itching 
to make his next move. Then Raymond is like, well, if she'll abandon her kids for me, sis might be down with the, you know, the shenanigans. He opens up and tells her of all of the scamming that he had done with all of the women from the Lonely Hearts Club, including the fact that he intended on scamming her. But he had fallen for her and she was different than all of the rest. This actually makes Martha feel special. She found this little tidbit of information to be romantic. And also to his surprise, she is encouraging him not only to continue the scamming, but sis wants to be a part of it. She wants in on it as well. Now it was speculated that her reason for being so on board with this and so excited to be a part of it is the fact that she saw this as an opportunity to like even the score with the thin pretty women. Girls who had taunted her for being overweight, girls who had no issue getting a job because they were thin, girls who had no issue getting a husband because they were prettier and thinner than her. Meanwhile, she was just at the house all by her lonesome. In her mind, these women that he finessed represented that thinner, prettier woman who had contributed to her misery and humiliation over the years. It was her turn to get her leg back. She delighted in the thought or idea that these women would believe that they had met this charming Casanova of a man and that they would catch feelings for him Meanwhile, he is just there to take what he can get from them and was in fact all hers. The two decide that it's best to just continue the scam just to see it started. He will respond to the ads, meet up with them, finesse them, get what he can and get out. Meanwhile, Martha would be posing as his loving sister. Now their first target as a duo is school teacher Esther Hen. She and Raymond exchange numerous letters and he is feeling like he don't have much time to waste. So he is laying it on thick. She falls for him fast and hard and Raymond is like, why wait? Like, let's just do it now. Let's just get married. Now Esther, believing that she has found love and a good man, she accepts the proposal. The two of them have a very brief wedding ceremony and then literally for the first four days, he is extremely nice to her. But she has not been allowed to share a bed with her new husband. Instead of them consummating their marriage, literally every night he retreats to his own room and she is forced to share a room with his loving sister Martha. The first couple days, she just, she thinks it's weird, but she just lets it ride. She shares the room with her brand new sister-in-law. But after a couple days, she begins asking questions because this is just too weird and it's going on for too long. As soon as she expresses that she does not like this, Martha blows up. She responds so explosively. She is very hostile and Esther is confused. Like she's like, this is just so bizarre, girl. And why are you so mad? What was even more perplexing is the switch up that she had witnessed in Raymond. He had also been pressuring her to add him as the beneficiary to her insurance policies to sign over her teacher's pension to him and not only that the two of them began making these like jokes but she could tell it was like some truth to him about a woman who had went to Spain with him and did not want to listen and sis never returned she deals with this for weeks like they are completely nasty to her Raymond is taking all of her money all the time he was also stealing money from her that she tried to hide from him until finally she decided you know what I'm leaving she had moved into Jane's home with him and Martha but at the point at which she decided this was just too much and she was unhappy she leaves with nothing like she leaves it all behind when she leaves they decide that they're going to take this show on the road their next target being a middle-aged widow by the name of Myrtle Young in Green Forest Arkansas Raymond responds to her ad he is wooing her with his words and introducing her to his loving kind sister Martha she is enamored by him enchanted by this man now his marriage proposal came a little early and sis thought it was a little too soon but nevertheless she eagerly accepts and the two travel to illinois to tie the knot now as before the bride is expecting to solidify they win with a little bump and grind but is told that instead she will be sharing a room with her good old sister-in-law martha now she tells them oh no baby that's not happening no nope and martha and raymond they play it cool but in the background they decide that they are going to heavily laced her drink with sedatives and so throughout the night they are sneaking sedatives into her drink until she finally just passes out now somehow they managed to actually board her onto a bus headed to little rock and by the time she reaches the destination the other people on the bus are looking like you know 
something don't seem quite right. Like her sleep didn't seem like the typical normal sleep to the next destination sleep. They immediately feel like something is wrong. And so when they get to Little Rock, she is rushed to the hospital, but it's too late. She dies shortly after her arrival before she could even tell anybody about how she had just gotten married, about how it might've been these two. Like she didn't get the opportunity to tell anybody anything. Their next target was 66 year old widow Janet Faye. Janet had decided to take the LHC approach to find her next lover because she felt like at her age, she probably wouldn't find a husband the conventional way. Nevertheless, sis still had hope for love. And she is delighted when she receives a letter from a smooth gentleman by the name of Charles Martin. Now, Janet was a very religious woman. She was a Roman Catholic and she was, y'all, she was full of the religion, okay? She was elated when he is writing to her about God and Jesus and all of the things Catholic Roman Catholic related, like all of the things. And she does not question it when he requests a lock of her hair. And like I said, that might have been a thing back in the day. I don't know. We know y'all. Shortly after he receives that little lock of hair in the mail, they arrange for him to come down and meet her in person in mid-December of 1948. And the moment that she lays eyes on him, she is submitting. Charles, who was really 30 year old Raymond Fernandez with little white streaks in his hair to make himself appear gray and a little bit older, had traveled all of this way to come meet her, accompanied by his sister Martha. He brings her a bouquet of flowers and they sit for hours and discuss their faith and all of the things that they have in common allegedly. He tells her that it's a goal of his to get married again and how he didn't think that it was in the cards for him at this age. But meeting her made him believe that it is in fact possible. The new year rolls around and in the weeks prior she has become completely enamored by Charles. Ray Charles. He tells her that his time there is coming to an end and that he just cannot see himself leaving without her. He asks her to pack up her belongings and join him back in NYC. And Jenna is all in. She agrees. She packs up most of her belongings, everything that they had space for. And she looks forward to riding off into the sunset with her new man and her new soon-to-be sister-in-law and just living happily ever after. But that is the furthest thing from what happens. When they reach their destination and Janet is kind of seeing like this is not exactly what I thought it would be. She is writing a letter to her stepdaughter and when they find out that in this letter she is speaking ill of them and just how things were not going how she expected them to. Martha takes a hammer and hits her over the head with it. This only injures her and Raymond decides to finish her off. He wraps his hands around this little lady's neck and squeezes until he no longer feels a pulse. Afterward, the couple sits and bounces ideas off of each other on how to properly dispose of her. And Raymond remembers that his sister, his real sister, has a basement with a lot of empty space. So they agree to take Janet there until they can figure things out further. They purchase this huge trunk, put Janet inside, takes her to his sister's house, asks if they can store it there for a little while. Now she being the nice sister that she is, and I guess just happy he not trying to stay there. She agrees to allow him to store the trunk there in her basement for a couple of days. Of course, not telling her what's inside. Now they figure they only have a couple of days before the trunk starts to give off an odor and kind of raise a red flag. They needed to move quickly. So they go rent a house over in Queens that has a cellar. They go back to his sister's house, gets the trunk, digs a hole in the cellar, puts Janet in the hole, covers it with cement. Once the cement dries, they return to the real estate agent and tell her they changed their mind about the house. Janet had a lot more valuables that she wasn't able to bring because they did not have the space for it in the car. Initially, Raymond wanted to just cut his losses, like take what they physically had and just move forward to the next woman. But Martha, who now served as his lover and his secretary, she was the brains, or like thereof, of the operation. She's like, no, that's too much to leave behind. She devises a plan to retrieve them. They'll send for them via Janet's stepdaughter, Mary, who she was trying to write. Martha types up a letter as Janet, detailing how much fun she's having, how in love she is with Raymond or Charles. 
as she knows him. How happy she is that God has sent her a wonderful man and she just needed one small little favor from her stepdaughter. Have her valuables shipped to her. In the letter, Martha gives the address, signs it as Janet, and mails it off. From there, they travel to Grand Rapids, Michigan to meet up with Delphine Downing, a widow that he had been writing through the club. Now, Delphine had really lost her husband in the war, and she was left with a two-year-old daughter. It was a goal of hers to remarry kind of quickly for stability, and she feared that her options were limited considering the fact that she had a child, and these are like the late 40s like you know things were a little different. Delphine welcomes Raymond and Martha into her home of course believing that they are in fact siblings and that Martha had just come along for the ride so he doesn't have to take it along you know that kind of thing can be boring and or dangerous. Martha puts on a front like she is just so excited to meet her brother's new love. They are both playing with her daughter and it's just a good time. Meanwhile Raymond is landed on thick. He is romancing Delphine and she is very excited about his visit giving her literally no reason to suspect that she and her daughter are in danger. Now this one was a little different because he actually sleeps with Delphine. Meanwhile Martha is becoming super jealous. He is of course telling Martha that he only does it because he is trying to really be convincing and that it's just all an act. She should not be worried about a thing and as the days go by she is just becoming more and more agitated and jealous. Delphine is noticing a change in Martha's behavior and she is feeling like it's not normal, which is not. She begins to question their relationship and if they are in fact brother and sister. This sparks a huge argument between him and Delphine and eventually they are able to, you know, calm everything down. As soon as the dust settles though, he drops sleep aids in her dream. Just enough to knock her out until morning at least. The problem is while she is knocked out, her daughter begins to cry because you know that's what two-year-olds do sometimes. Martha makes an attempt to like coddle the child and just calm her down, but the baby wasn't trying to hit it. Like she just wasn't here for Martha. You know, babies be known when your energy is bad. Martha gets extremely frustrated and begins choking the baby. Now she does not kill her, but she chokes her. And it leaves these red marks around the baby's neck, which then began to turn to some bruising and they start to panic because they're like, surely, when Delphine wakes up and sees these bruises on her baby's neck, like she is going to call the police. Something is going to be done and we are going to be in trouble. Raymond decides to go and get Delphine's late husband's revolver and shoots her. Now they stay in the house with Delphine laying as she is and taking care of her baby for the next couple of days. After a couple of days go by, Raymond decides, you know what, it's time for us to leave. Like, we have to leave here. And unfortunately, this little baby is about to have to meet a fate similar to her mother's. He instructs Martha to do it, though. Martha is like, no way. I cannot do it. And he tells her that she can and she will. Once done, they bury the two together side by side in the basement. And then they go on a date to the movies. Raymond and Martha return home from their little movie day rather late and so their plan was just to settle in and go right to sleep. But y'all, they didn't get much sleep before they heard a tapping at the door and it was the police who didn't even wait around for them to answer. They just knocked a couple of times and then next thing you know, they were entering the home. So the couple has, of course, no time at all to just react or put together a little plan. The police come in and they ask Raymond, are you Raymond Fernandez? Raymond does not respond. He is just standing there looking stupid. And Martha, being stupid, tells the police they better not lay a hand on her man. Baby, do you know how quick I would have been like, yes, that's him? I'm just playing. Let me stop making them jokes. Child, they laid fingers and cuffs on her man and on her ass too. They arrested both of them. Now they take a look around the house because they know for a fact that it does not belong to either of them. Furthermore, the reason that brought them there made them have reason to search the home, which we'll get to that. And of course, find Delphine and her daughter there. Now Raymond quickly confesses to many crimes, not just what they picked him up on and what they found in the basement. He claimed to have a body count of about 17. Even though he was only being sought after for three. Delphine, her daughter, 
and 66-year-old widow Janet Bay. See, her stepdaughter Mary had received the letter and knew right away that it was fraudulent. For one, her stepmother could not type. Two, the signature looked nothing like Janet Bay's signature. And three, it was not like her to just pick up and move away like this, especially without taking a lot of her things and wrapping up the loose ends at her home. Even if she had found love, like she knew that this was not how Janet would go about things. So when she received the letter, she took it straight down to the police station, along with her suspicions that something terrible had happened to Janet. And she was, of course, right, unfortunately. It didn't take police long at all to identify Charles Martin as really being Raymond Fernandez. And so they had been hot on their trail ever since and had finally caught up to them. When the story broke, they got a lot of attention from the media. And people were outraged that Martha had helped him. And they were really shocked that she helped him because they felt like she just didn't look like the type. And they told her up in the media. They called her the obese ogress, like the female version of an ogre, like Shrek, like Fiona. That was just one of the many horrible names that they called her in the newspaper. The media ridiculed her mercilessly, and rightfully so. Both Michigan and New York wanted to try them, but the couple wanted to be tried in Michigan because they were like, you know what, Michigan does not have the death penalty. We need to get our charges and sentencing done here because at least we'll get to leave. They were under the impression that only one state would be allowed to try them. So they were completely disappointed to find out that both states would be trying them for the crimes that were committed within their jurisdiction. Law enforcement actually lied to them and told them that if they wrote out and signed a full confession that they would only be charged and tried in Michigan. Child, that couldn't have been the furthest thing from the truth. And considering what they had done, nobody really cared that they had been lied to like this. They took their little confession and and after they were tried in Michigan, they were extradited to New York to face charges for Janet Faye. And both of them received the electric chair. The couple was executed on March 8th of 1951. Let me tell you what happened on that day. Raymond was distraught on their last day. He would have hated for his father to see him that day, I'm sure, because he could not even stand and walk to the electric chair. He was so weak and so afraid. So I don't know if this is still a thing, but it was back then on the like execution day or whatever it is. They start with the one that's like most afraid to go ahead and put them out of their misery. He had to go before Martha because he was so afraid. Like he was so much more shaken and stirred in his spirit than she was. Now his final words, let me tell you what they are. I want to shout it out. I love Martha. What do the public know about love? Just dramatic. Unfortunately, he was literally only 36. Martha had been dragged through the media as this willed beast. And so she was going to prove a point on her last day. She was tired of being ridiculed and just demeaned and drugged through the mud over her weight. So she said she was going to show them that she is not this gluttonous pig that they made her out to be. She is not going to overdo it on her last meal like everybody probably expects her to do. Then I guess this just said all oh, what the hell because she had ordered some fried chicken, some french fries and a salad on the side and then last minute she doubled the whole order. She said to hell with it. She had a double serving of fried chicken, a double serving of french fries and two salads to show them bitches that big girls eat salads too. That'll teach them. Now these were her final words. My story is a love story, but only those fortunate by love can know what I mean. I'm not unfeeling, stupid, or moronic. I am a woman who had a great love and always will have it. Imprisonment in the death house has only strengthened my feelings for Raymond. Girl. Anyway, they put her in that chair and fried sis like that chicken she had down to her last meal. Ain't that ironic? She fried chicken and they fried her. That's crazy. She was only 30 years old, but you couldn't tell looking at these pictures. Sis look a strong 42. And lest we not forget that she was born on May 6, 1920, making sis a what? A Taurus. Team Taurus, this is y'all's second week in a row and it's quite disturbing actually. The Honeymoon Killers is actually a movie that was made in the 70s. I have not watched it but it was made loosely based on them and so some of y'all might have seen it. I'm sure somebody has seen it. That pretty much sums up this story. Don't forget to give the video a like on your way out. Let me know your thoughts on this case. I know this video was hella long. I know it was. My mouth is dry. 
Anywho, as always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. But I am mad, but I'm not red. Uh, red, I am red. <laughs> so let me just shut up and get to telling you the story. Which I wouldn't be shutting up, whatever. Raymond Fernandez was born to Spanish immigrant parents on December 27, 1914. No, it wasn't. Brought him a lot of frustration, which sucked. Uh, he was very thin, very small, and he was not masculine at all. Bars. And he desperately de derived. No. And he desperately. Why do I want to say derived so bad? It's not derived, girl. Her name was Amans. I was gonna call this lady Emancipation. Get close though. Especially this one lady in particular by the name of Incarnation. That is not her name. And is Incarnation a word? Yeah, incarcerated. No, I don't think that's a word. Y'all know since introduced it. Introduced it. What the? Fuck? Selling little frozen delectables to British pur pur pur. The cellmate is pretty much the What bothered her most? He was sitting kneeling before his altar, chantering, chantering, what is that? He is writing letters all over the place. Swiping left, or is it swiping right? And the charm that he already had that really ruled, really ruled, reeled her in. In Milton, Florida on May 6th of 2000, 2000 what? And graduates first of her class, so sis was out here doing it on the education front. Why am I giving her kudos? Like she ain't a murderer. He is the one she's been dating and is currently pregnant with. Pregnant by. And the dur and the during girl. The two of them have a very brief meeting. Okay, brief meeting. Girl's a wedding. And not only that, the two of them be be started. Ugh. Now Jenna has a stepdaughter, and I believe it was a stepdaughter. They took the little confection, confection, ain't that sugar? Ugh.